Welcome and good evening. Um, on behalf of the Guarini Center, our affiliated faculty, Dick Stewart and Katrina Wyman, welcome to this discussion on energy private equity, the new reality of low oil prices. As you can see by the crowd in the room, there's a lot of intense interest in the topic and how low oil prices will affect the trajectory of both the American economy, the energy mix in the US, and of course, investment decisions. <coughs> Thankfully, we have an incredibly talented group of experts here to help guide us through these complicated questions. Stephen Coates, Thomas Edelman, Bob Gold, and Shia Jose, I'm sorry, Jose Zadeh, Jose Zadeh. Jose Zadeh are each at the forefront of the energy private equity field. And Robert Sieber of V&E, who I have to say is also a distinguished member of the faculty here nowadays, teaching the oil and gas law class is one of the leading energy law experts in the country. So we're in very good hands. And with that, I will turn it over to Robert. Well, thank you very much, Danielle. Is this working all right, sound-wise? Um, so let me just, um, before we get into the substance, um, tell you what we are trying to do here. Uh, this, is, this is for 90 minutes. Um, which is long for a panel, so we want to break it up a little bit. In the, we're going to devote the first part to uh, talking about how we got here, um, how oil prices developed, uh, what's the current state um, of the oil and gas industry in the United States, how does private equity fit in. We're going to do a Q&A session then after that, so about halfway through to address questions at that point that relate to that first part. And then in the second part, um, we will look forward and, um, and, and talk about and ask the panel how they view uh, investment opportunities uh, in, in, this, in this current environment. Um, as Danielle mentioned, um, I am, uh, I'm a partner in a law firm and um, as a as a lawyer, it is my job, it's part of my job description to answer questions from clients every day and sometimes difficult questions. So for once today, it's my online privilege to be the one who can, uh, who can ask the tough questions. Uh, before I do so, um, I want to just create some context and turn the clock uh, back uh, a little bit, and um, not by a lot, just two years. So um, we are 2016, uh, by the beginning of 2014, um, a Reuters article on um, forecast for oil prices, so that's beginning of 2014, had this to say. Our monthly survey of 27 analysts projected Brent crude oil would average $104 a barrel in 2014. The poll expects Brent to average $102 in 2015. A few months later in an academic paper uh, in July 2014 by James Hamilton, who is a prominent energy economist, <coughs> He ended with the following sentence. My conclusion is that $100 oil is here to stay. By the end of 2014, when prices had already started to decline, which they started to do in mid-2014, an article by Dan Stevens of the Energy Prospectus Group, which is a, a, a research group, had the title Energy Crisis as Early as 2016. And then I quote, low oil prices today may be setting the world up for an oil shortage as early as 2016. My forecast models for 2015 assume that crude oil prices will remain depressed during the first quarter, then slowly ramp up and accelerate as next winter approaches. Well, this is the winter we are currently in, and um, if you're here, you probably know that last week oil prices were as low as $28 per barrel. While all this was happening in 2014, um, in, 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 or started to happen in the oil and gas market, um, it was still a record fundraising year for energy private equity. 
uh, by the end of 2014, almost 30 billion of capital had been raised by 33 energy-focused private equity funds, which made it the highest number of energy private equity funds ever formed in one year. And that was right after 2013, when 30 billion um, had already been raised by 27 funds. Apparently, all um, in 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 the apparent in the belief that the world, as it was known two years ago, by the end of uh, 2000, by the beginning of 2014, uh, would continue. So, um, if we look at the developments uh, over the just over the last two years, um, it's leading to my first question, and that is. <coughs> How is it possible that so many people were so wrong? And um, I said I would ask tough questions, so maybe Tom is a good person to ask the tough question first. Well, thank you, Robert. <clears throat> um, uh, the, the reason Robert started with that question is he wanted to immediately diffuse the idea that any of us were experts uh, uh, in this field at all. And, uh, uh, the, the only good news is that all the way back to Colonel Drake and, uh, and John D. Rockefeller, this has been a wildly cyclical business. Uh, oil is not like diamonds or postage stamps where if you can get an attractive price, you can stick it in the drawer and wait for a later moment. It is a bulky, large, expensive to move and store commodity that if you badly want one more barrel so that you can go and see your in-laws for the weekend, you will pay a small fortune to fill up your car. On the other hand, if anyone offers you a barrel of oil that you do not want, you will actually pay them not to give it to you or leave it in your front yard. So this is the ultimate uh, uh, cyclical commodity, and I think in retrospect, uh, this is my sixth collapse, unfortunately. Um, I think in retrospect, it is fairly easy to see these things, but of course they only happen because few, if any, of us see them in advance. And I think very simply, what happened was for the last six, seven years, the American, primarily American oil and gas industry, had taken enormous advantage of technology to drill horizontal wells and frack reservoirs that gave up a lot of oil and gas they'd never given up economically before. That allowed us to add three quarters of a million to a million barrels of oil production a day that we no longer had to import. But fortunately, our Chinese friends were going in the exact opposite direction and needed roughly three quarters of a million to a million barrels a day to uh, fuel the growth of their economy. As soon as those two trends went out of line, we got better and better at fracking the shale formations and their economic demand for additional petroleum began to slow down. These curves crossed, and all of us were humbled rather quickly. If, Steve, if you don't mind, you know, addressing the same question. Well, no. I mean, How I, come we were all so wrong? Well, I, I think people think about these, these downturns in the, in the context of what's happened in the past, and I think that I agree with everything that, that Tom just said. The, the difference here is we've typically had something to fix this problem, and that's you know OPEC willing to cut production. <clears throat> and this just came at a very unique time when the U.S. I mean, I'm not an expert at world affairs, but you've got basically the Saudis willing to continue drilling as much as they're drilling, even more so, other members of OPEC as well. And so there's not a quick fix to this problem. It's got to slowly work itself out. And that's not something we've had historically where we've had this is it started sort of as a glut and turned into a bit of a price war. And, and I'm not sure where we are right now. And price war a glut, but there's no easy fix to it. Well, Shia, you, um, I know from you know, conversations, you have a very global perspective on, on, on the oil market. How, how do you see it, particularly um, you know, when, uh, when the word OPEC gets mentioned? Well, <clears throat> and, and Robert, th thank you for having me here. I think um, it, it's one, one of the key things you have to think about when you think about oil is I think Tom did a great job of talking about the fundamental supply-demand dynamic. But when I when I first started looking at the sector, one of the things I heard as um, as a junior analyst on on the sell side bank in Wall Street was no other business uh, that you're ever going to participate in 
<coughs> will ever result in a war over the supply for that business. And that was a little bit of an exaggeration because people have gone to war for other commodities beside oil. But I think the key thing to understand is that there's a lot of complexity when you think about oil. And, and clearly what's happened here is a, is a disruptive technological revolution here in the US. And I think for those of you who may not follow oil, I think a good way to think about it is in 2014, the US added 3.6 million barrels a day of production and lost 2.4. Put that in perspective. We added Venezuela's entire production in one year, excuse me, Iraq's entire production in one year and lost Venezuela in that same year from declines. That just doesn't happen very frequently in this market. So you've clearly had an onset of too much supply, but I think there is also another element here which people are maybe um, not, not giving a, a lot of focus to, and that is OPEC has got a multi-tiered agenda. Clearly, one of the things that the Saudis don't want to do is to create room for Iranian barrels, and that's obviously very intuitive. Uh, another thing that the Saudis want to do is a, a page out of their playbook in the 1980s. Uh, in the 1980s, we came out of the <coughs> Iran oil, uh, the Iranian revolution, <coughs> the Arab oil embargo. So we had a situation where supply was diminishing. In today's dollars, oil was 125 bucks a barrel. And the U.S. was shifting from nuclear, excuse me, from oil to nuclear and the electric fleet, and gas mileage was going down for cars. And, and you know, the Saudis started the decade in the 1980s by cutting, and they cut in 1980, 81, 82, 83, 84, and 85. In November of 1985, the Saudis had cut by 80%. And if you're the Saudi finance minister, and you're sitting with the king, explaining to him that your production is down 80% and prices are down some 20 or 30% is probably not a very pleasant conversation. And I think what the Saudis learned is that when you have a supply problem, which is what we have here, going back to the shale discussion, you really have to think about the efficacy of price control. And what we're seeing here is a pivot to competition control, which intuitively and academically makes a lot of sense. And outside of Saudi Arabia, outside of OPEC, and outside of the US, you've got what I think uh, I've lovingly heard uh, called the Rodney Dangerfield barrels. That's 55 million barrels a day of production that is neither OPEC nor shale, and gets, just like Rodney Dangerfield, very little respect. And that's a very critical adjustment mechanism in the market, and I'm sure Robert will talk about it later, but that's a, you know, that's a quick tour around the world in a couple of minutes, if I may. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we'll come back to, to, to some of your you know, initial observations, but I want to ask Bob specifically because um, you know, Bob was raising a, an almost two billion size fund um, exactly as all of this was unfolding. Um, and, um, you know, if you look at my bio, you can see why I know something about it. And um, how, what was it like? What did you explain yeah. to your investors at that time? And, and, and why was it, why did it still end up so uh, incredibly successful? Uh, so, I, by the way, thanks for, for having me. I'm, like many of you, I'm a graduate of the law school. I graduated in 84, and as Shire has heard me say, when I graduated from college in 80, oil was significantly more expensive than it is today. So, you know, 36 years later, it's less valuable uh, in real terms, not even inflation adjusted, than it was. Uh, so, how does that get me to raising a $1.9 billion fund? We, it was actually $2 billion, Robert, if you want to be precise. <laughs> so. You know, it was really interesting. We, um, we raised a fund, uh, about a billion one, uh, when oil was 100, and it was really our first big institutional fund. And we got the you know, typical group of endowments and foundations and state pension plans, uh, all of whom invested in it. And very quickly after we closed that, like less than six months, because we had a fair amount of success quickly, we went out to raise a fund that was almost twice as big. And we started in the fall of 14, about a month or two before uh, the Saudis announced that they were not going to cut production and that you know, there was that big OPEC meeting. And that did really shake everyone's world um, in fundraising and substantively. And the reason why it did was, um, if you look at Saudi production over the last 25 years, it was perfectly correlated to the price of oil, which is to say is if oil went down, they would cut production. 
if oil went up because they never wanted prices to get too high because they were worried if they did, you know, we'd all buy Teslas or, um, you know, would unleash fracking or all the things that did happen, they would increase production. And like I said, that was perfectly correlated until the fourth quarter of uh, 2014. And then uh, prices dropped and they announced uh, no reduction in, in supply. So we were in the middle of fundraising. And I have to admit, I would wake up at like 2 or 3 in the morning every night and check oil prices and then be up for the whole rest of the night because I had six fundraising meetings. And I knew you know, it would be a pretty difficult process. And then we had that slight bump in price uh, in the first quarter. Started coming down. But one of the really interesting things that happened was investors started feeling that oil was cheap and they could be contrarian. That you know, our strategy at least involved uh, you know, essentially acquiring and developing uh, oil reserves, but not producing it for several years because it took a while to develop it. And it would be a wonderful opportunity to essentially buy low and sell high which is not what most institutional investors do. They say they want to do that, but as you see, because you're able to raise a lot of capital when things are expensive, and it's very difficult to raise capital when things are cheap, you know, that they, they, they're not the contrarians, but there, there was a host of them. And I remember walking into, the C, into an office of a CIO of a very well-known foundation, and written on her very large blackboard was, oil is cheap, we need to invest in more energy. And so we found that we could tell that. Is that just to make you feel good? I th <laughs> it must have been, because <laughs> it was about five months later before they before they invested. But you know, we found that th that among the you know hundreds and hundreds of institutional investors, there were a few dozen who view the this opportunity, the opportunity because we closed the fund in the middle of fifteen, and it's you know, maybe the opportunity is bringing up as being a buying opportunity. And one that they wanted to take advantage of. And not, not to go on and on, but I think the, the one thing that has changed as we speak to investors and we get asked about this is, I think a lot of people used to view investing in, it, in energy as non-market correlated. I mean, have you guys heard that over? And it turns out now it seems to be completely correlated to market. It's almost like traders wake up, if oil is down, they sell stocks. If oil is up, they buy stocks. And you're reading a lot that that makes absolutely no sense. America is still a net importer. That sure the economies of Texas and North Dakota and Oklahoma, you know, clearly are going to suffer. But you know the rest of us who now are just paying a lot less for our energy ought to have more disposable income, and that ought to help the market. I think the one thing which has investors really scratching their head in their assumptions and in investing in a fund that was long oil is why other financial assets are performing so poorly when oil is performing poorly. Does that, and if, Tom, you want to pick up on that question because, you know, um, that's, that's from my perspective, it's also a puzzling uh, phenomenon. It used to be very easy. Lower energy prices were good for the economy. Now it seems like we have lower energy prices and suddenly it's viewed as a negative. How do, how do you view that? Well, I, I, I think like all markets, uh, the, the market for oil and the financial markets have an overlay of different levels of concern. And more than anything else, uh, the market hates uncertainty. Uh, oil is a fabulously important commodity to the world as consumers, but also as producers. We produce and burn between 95 and 97 million barrels of oil a day, and ranging from Iran to Iraq to Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, Venezuela, uh, Brazil, a number of others, major segments of a very large number of economies are deeply threatened by the extent of this decline. I think what you got was a superficial quick analysis, and again, many of us making, in fairness, the same mistake, that a reduction in the price of oil from $100 to $75 was going to be a worldwide tax cut, good for consumers, good for the cost of transportation, good for economic growth, putting money in consumers' po pockets. But if you translate it into real estate, if you translate it into farm products, any market that collapses by 70% that is a major market, think of Apple in the next six months was to decline in value 75%. 
half the graduates of the major universities of the United States would be unemployed and see no prospect of employment. It is threatening to the world economy that an institution as large as the oil market is in this degree of chaos. It went way beyond the idea of a nice tax cut. China, do you want to yeah, add I'll, something? I'll, I'll, I'll just add to that maybe with, with some figures and stats. If you look at the correlation coefficient between high yield or junk energy junk bonds as an asset class and the Hang Seng in July, two, two very different markets, the correlation coefficient spiked to 90%. So 90% of the variation in one allegedly or purportedly could be explained by variation in the other. Now, usually when you have markets that move, as, as, as Tom said, so sharply and so quickly, that causes a level of confusion. But there's also another factor, I think, at play here, which is in the United States, pre-2005, we had a very different energy market. We had a very different energy funding model. As a percentage of the capital markets, the high yield index, uh, five out of every 100 issues were energy denominated. In 2014, just before we saw the apex, that had quintupled to something like 20% or just under 20%. So if you're an institutional money manager and you've seen 20% of your portfolio evaporate in four months, you have to rebalance. And so, you know, short term, and, and frankly for us, I think many of us sitting here on this panel, that is a once in a 30 year opportunity because if you look at the level of volatility in the marketplace, and I'll, I'll, I'll just give you a few more stats, and unfortunately, Robert didn't know how many stats I'm going to throw at the audience. But, it's perfect. Uh, um, it is a university here. <laughs> it is a university. So, if, if you actually look at the energy market, there's no shortage of data. This is a very, very data-rich business, and the data can be very confusing. And, and the best example I'll give you is this. There are a lot of very capable, very intelligent people that have dedicated themselves to watching this market. And if you look at the estimates by analysts, pick your favorite investment bank and your least favorite investment bank, and the delta between the two is mind-boggling. So the, the, lowest, the lowest analyst price, broker price for oil is about 20 or so dollars. I've seen something that's lower than that recently. And the highest short term is around 70. Any market where intelligent people with access to the same information that work for well-recognized national institutions have a debate over where a year from now something's at 20 or 70 tells you that that asset is mispriced because it's impossible to price assets when you can't agree if it's a high commodity price or a low commodity price environment. Now, when you look four years out, that spread collapses to something like high 60s, low 70s. For those of us sitting here who have the skill set, the funding structure, and the ability to buy good assets, add value to them for four or five years, buy them when volatility is high when nobody can really put a price tag on them, and find a way to exit them in four or five years, it's a remarkable opportunity that you don't see very often. So I'm sort of deviating a little bit from it, but I thought it was, it was an interesting sort of segue. Absolutely. So um, uh, you being among, uh, you know, the category of favorites, uh, where do you come in in the 20 to 70 <laughs> forecast? I think the last time a private equity guy predicted oil prices <laughs> successfully was never, <laughs> um, especially on the short term. So we, we, that's not a core competency for us. I think if we are earning our keep with our partners, uh, it's really the ability to understand industry cost structures over a four or five year period in time. And while you know the short term, you know, I'll give you an example. I would challenge anybody who's sitting here to think about one industry that they follow, just one industry, where a 2% move in supply leads to a 70 to 80% move in prices. There's just, you know, there's no, this is a margin of error prediction business when you think about the short term. On the other hand, if you think about the long term, and, you know, I'm not going to go into this unless we, we decide to later, there are a lot of fundamental factors that you can begin to factor in uh, for, you know, decline rates and marginal costs and things like that. Over time, this industry will trend towards the cost of production because no industry has grown through bankruptcy indefinitely. 
So if, if you can find a paradigm to look at economics over a five-year period, and you can buy in the front end, I think that's ultimately all we can hope to do. Aren't, aren't those predictions, that, I think the reason so few deals are getting done, the sellers buy into the 70, and the buyers buy into the 20. And as a result, most of us are available for panels, if any of you are. <laughs> <laughs> but um, l let me um, kind of take stock from the first round of observations here. So over the last you know, few years, we saw massive increase in, United, in U.S. production as a result of technology changes, but uh, corresponding to you know, major funding going into the domestic uh, E&P uh, exploration and production industry, somewhat in reliance on the Saudis doing what they have always been doing, which was the control <coughs> factor for worldwide su supply. Uh, so that has not occurred, and um, whatever the U.S. added to world supply was incremental supply. And that funding, you know, the funding that created that, a big contributor to that funding was private equity, energy uh, pri private equity, which in the bigger scheme of the <laughs> private equity history is still a relatively new phenomenon. Um, Steve is general counsel of the largest private equity fund, and their first fund was formed in 2001, I believe. 2002, yeah. And um, so did private equity, energy private equity, create a bit, a, dig a bit of its own hole here by providing massive, uh, you know, funding to, to, contribute, uh, to contribute to the problem that it's, uh, that it's facing now? Well, I'd, I'd never admit to that. But, um, <laughs> but look, I, I think what was said earlier is right. It, the, the funding would have come because what we saw was in just an enormous technology revolution. And, and this was, I mean, it was, it was literally in its, in its, it was in its infancy when I came to Riverstone from Vincent Elkins. I, I, you know, the, 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 really over the last, you know, 78 years, the, the growth and sort of shale revolution, as everyone called it, it was going to get funded in some way because you had, you had people who were basically looking at fields that had been, for all intents and purposes, tapped out that had, that had huge volumes. Um, and so I think the money would have been there from somewhere because you just had, you had an oil industry in the U.S. that people had sort of written off as these are some, there's some long life fields that are available, but we've got to, we, you know, we've got to find oil and gas elsewhere. And, and the dynamic has changed completely. I guess they think it was your right, fault. So. <laughs> um, Tom? Well, uh, I think the private equity business, if, if, you, if you think of the full scale of the oil and gas business, U.S. private equity is de minimis. 85% um, <clears throat> of the reserves in the world are held by national oil companies. Uh, of the 15% remaining, most of that is held by the major oil companies uh, that none of us do much business with. We basically do business with the mid-size independents, although some fairly large independents have recently become mid-size, <clears throat> down to, to small. So they were the innovators. So in a sense, I think we all looked and perhaps felt more important than we were because we were fueling many of the innovators who brought this technology into very widely accepted <coughs> use in the United States. Uh, and it certainly changed the, the trajectory of the curve. But um, I, I make the case that, uh, uh, that, that the blame is exactly where you started. We had some macro things, the U.S. shale revolution in China. But I believe that uh, the Saudis have made a terrible error. And being Saudis, they are very reluctant to admit it and back up. But uh, uh, it is very hard for me to believe that it is in the interest of the Saudi royal family and their maintenance of control of the greatest treasure trove on the face of the earth to accept an 80% reduction in their revenues uh, and to increase, I would suspect, the degree of chaos in the Middle East. Uh, I, I think they have made an error that while none of us unfortunately can predict it despite all the data, uh, they will need to figure out how to reverse at some point in time. When is a much harder question. Yeah, there, there was an interesting article this morning, I'm not even sure what it means, where they said OPEC and non-OPEC producers to come to an agreement. I'm not sure what non-OPEC producers really means. It's 15,000 companies operating in the shale basins in the U.S. But ultimately, the, 
the first story that was sort of pitched by the media, which was that somehow this is about shutting down the shale producers, made no sense at all because everybody who's, I mean, as a lawyer, you know, all that happens is the guys that bought it at 80, they go bankrupt and they sell to the guys that then get to buy it at 30. And you have service prices coming down, so you have a much more efficient industry, U.S. oil industry coming out of this than you went in. So that never really made sense. There's, you know, something else to play. And I agree with you, they've, they've made a mistake because they've only got so much time to hold on and, and, and keep this price where it is. They've got to pay their own, um, you know, they've got to manage their own budgets as well. I'm not sure how long it can go on, but... Um, uh, Shia, 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 do you want to comment on Saudi motivations <laughs> with the crystal ball in front of you? Let me maybe try to tie a few of the concepts together, if I may. I think the, the Saudis are embarking on a multi-pronged policy, and, I, and this is, a, at least in my view, I think one way to measure the efficacy of their policy, and I think this is very readily measurable, is they've repriced the cost of capital. Why is that significant? I'll use the tech analogy maybe to answer the question that you asked. And the, the tech bust in 2002 wasn't the fault of venture capital. It was all these IPO investors who bid up valuations to level where the tech guys were making um, super economic rent on, on projects that really weren't creating value commensurate with their exit. And in the oil and gas market, the analogy was people were buying acreage for 2,000 bucks an acre, putting a few holes in the ground, and flipping it for 15,000 bucks an acre in the public market. It was this voracious appetite for public equity and public debt in a low interest rate environment that fueled the, the boom. Now, if you want to stop that, and, and um, for, for those of you who've spent time in this sector, you will know what the average archetype is for an oil and gas CEO. And the only way to stop an oil and gas CEO is to cut off his funding supply. And so what the Saudis have done is they've repriced capital. something much more colorful. 50% um, of, uh, and of, of course I'm generalizing, there's some terrific management teams, but you know, by and large, this is a very capital intensive industry. And the Saudis, if you look at our capital markets here in the US, which are probably the most functioning, most well-developed system of anywhere in the world, 50% of the high yield bonds trade at distress levels. If you compare that with the global financial crisis, it is a multiple higher than what it was back then. You compare that with 1998 when Russia defaulted on its sovereign obligations, it was nowhere near in this, um, in this uh, order of magnitude. So I think, well, I, I agree with Tom, I think the Saudis can only do this for so long The debt to GDP is set to go to 30 or 40 percent of the current oil price from something like 2% a few years ago. So there's a, you know, there's a limit to which you can run at a deficit. Um, but certainly, the Saudis have time on their side. The other producers don't. And it's just a question of who blinks first. Bob, do you want to add anything? Um, I'll try to. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's interesting listening to the conversation. You, you, you might reach the conclusion that fracking is bad. or some, And I know we're at NYU, and everyone here is aligned with Mark Ruffalo and uh, <laughs> wants to convince the governors to stop it. But you know, it began in the natural gas sector. And not that long ago, natural gas was $14 a 1,000 cubic feet. And today, it's about $2 a 1,000 cubic feet. And I would guess in my lifetime, it won't get much above $3 a 1,000 cubic feet uh, and stay there. And <clears throat> for people who have to heat their homes and our ability to convert from coal to natural gas and generate less carbon, that's a wonderful thing. And likewise with oil, you know, America has added about 4 million barrels a day of production. And I mean, it wasn't driven by private equity, it was driven by guys like Harold Hamm and uh, Mitchell Energy who started it. Um, maybe all private equity did, it, to, to Shia's point, is it bid up the cost of it by driving up the cost of leases and uh, fracking crews and everything else. But, you know, it's one of the great, um, uh, points of progress of a, the American industrial society that we went from a period we thought we'd be importing essentially all of our oil to where North America starts thinking about becoming energy independent and all the geopolitical issues and all the wars we fought become somehow less, uh, I don't know, less volatile potentially. So yeah, prices are down and you know we all have to you know face lower returns, but on the whole, that's good. 
Now, I, I guess what I would, I, I would say is, so, you know, how is private equity now reacting to it? And essentially, there's a, there's a large funding freeze. I mean, things are not being done. And it's amazing how quickly that has happened. Um, you know, uh, it, if you look at the Wood McKenzie data, break even on a barrel in, let's say, the Bakken in North Dakota, the Permian in Texas, was about $50 a barrel. So when oil was 100, you know, you couldn't put enough money in it. And you didn't need private equity. The banks were flooding it with capital. Wall Street was f funding it with capital. There was just no shortage. Well, today, it's, maybe it's $45 a barrel, so at 28 or 30, no one's putting any money in it. And very quickly, you've seen tremendous supply, I know you're probably going to get to this, supply destruction. America's, you know, instead of producing 4 million barrels than it used to now, it's, probably, it's producing about 3.5 million barrels. And I'd say another six months, there'll be, you know, another 500,000 barrels less production from the U.S. And I, I don't know if it was Tom or Shire said, it's only about a 2% oversupply that the world consumes 93 to 95 million barrels a day, and it produces 94 to 96 million barrels a day. So you're about a million to two million barrels a day excess, which you know adds up over time. But it won't be long before that excess evaporates, and then the interesting question is what happens then? Yes, Tom. Well, <clears throat> the, the reason this uh, discussion, not just among us, but in the press and among analysts and others, is so robust uh, it's a little bit like predicting the weather. There are a lot of factors that go into this, including such things as the fact that until very recently in New York there was no winter and therefore no heating oil uh, uh, demand in the northeastern United States. Many, many things play into this. The, the two big factors, I think, uh, uh, Bob, that are, that are coming is I don't know about the rest of you, but Almost every day, I meet with another producer who is interested in obtaining funding, usually on ridiculous terms, mind you, but interested in obtaining funding. And time after time after time, they m march in with their flip presentations with three or four associates and assure me that they can get a good rate of return on at least the best of their properties at $35 oil. Now, I don't think they're lying, but in many cases, I think they are simply wrong and they're using marginal pricing. But there is no question that there has been a radical shift in the cost curve as a result of the, of the revenue curve. I was in a, a board meeting this morning in, in Texas, and we were going through numbers on production in a, in a big field uh, outside uh, Denver. And uh, uh, the costs in that field have been cut more than 45% in the last 15 months. That is way beyond what anyone in that room would have said was possible when the decline right. began. And some of it's as simple as telling Halliburton and the rig companies, look, I'm going to pay you a lot less or you're not going to have my business. But just as importantly, we found that these fracks where you're putting half a million to a million pounds of pressure against the rock, you don't necessarily need it. You can frack it with half as much pressure. You can use slick water as opposed to gels that cost half as much. There are many things that are being done in the business, and the worst news for us in the business, the worst news is that if I'm wrong and all these guys coming to see us are right, their cost curve is chasing this revenue down, and it's going to be a lot harder to solve this problem than if you could hold the cost to produce a barrel of oil at 50 and therefore choke off the oxygen to the room. Yeah, I think it's, you know, there's going to, obviously, some of these service costs are going to come back up when this price comes up, but a lot of these, a lot of the productivity that's been built in the last six months or so, it's not going to be lost. It's going to be a much more efficient industry. But um, the, <clears throat> you know, it's amazing to me that the amount of, you know, I think like you all, people come every day to us and they, they have opportunities. There's an enormous amount of pessimism. N nobody can make, you know, other than the Saudis potentially, on a on a well by well basis, depending on where it is. Maybe if you're in the, you know, the the, the heart of the heart, you can make money on a well by well basis. On a fully loaded basis, with you know your company overhead, you, nobody's making money. It's impossible. That tells you two things: one, that it's, you know, it's going to go back up because you can't operate essentially, you know, solve an industry forever. Um, but but nobody, there's so much pessimism now, and also there's really no debt available right now. This is very different than 
2007, when we came out of the crisis, you had a, you know, a momentary dip in prices, but the difference was you could get essentially covenant-like deals done a year later. And, and no one's given that to you today. So not only does no one want to catch the falling sword on prices, nobody can finance anything right now. So everyone's at a, at a bit of a standstill, you know, billions and you know, tens of billions of dollars available in private equity, and, and really nobody's buying right now. It shows you how bad it is. That used to be called a falling knife. It's now a falling sword. <laughs> um, let, let, let me pick up on that theme, actually. We, so we've been talking about equity. Let's talk about debt. And uh, Shia mentioned 20% you know, of all high yield in the last few years was going into, the, uh, into energy. Um, most, not most, all trading uh, way below par. Um, there have been bankruptcies but not as many as some predicted would, uh, would, would be the case at this point. So a uh, question to all of you, what's happening? What is yet to happen? <coughs> will, there, will there be more carnage? And, um, and when, when, when is it going to come? What will it mean? I don't know. comments about the role of the, <clears throat> the debt capital markets. If, if you think about what's happened here in the U.S., it's probably the greatest technological revolution, certainly of, of the last two generations. I can't think of anything maybe outside of the internet that's touched so many parts of the economy and so staggeringly quickly. Um, so if you think about the impact that that's had on the overall capital markets, and, and maybe segueing into Robert's question, the version 1.0, your chances of success were something like 1 in 12 if you were, if you were exploring. Version 2.0, your risk is not that you're going to drill a well and find you've got no oil. The risk is you'll drill a well and find you've got no return after all the money you've spent drilling it. And, and, and so when you... Um, when, when you think about defaults and bankruptcies, you know, this is a sector that was supported by a combination of stable and high oil prices, record low interest rates, and access to cheap credit. So the average debt to EBITDA ratio across the industry was something like one times in 2005. That's pre-shale, pre-OPEC. In 2014, with the shale revolution, uh, pre-OPEC, that was close to two and a half times. So we've seen a doubling of the amount of debt on the balance sheets of these companies. This year, if you believe these, uh, the midpoint of the, you know, the consensus estimates that I gave you, the 20 to 70, so take that average of it at 45, that, that is going to mushroom to five times EBITDA. And this is for a sector that on a good day should sell for six times EBITDA. Um, so we think that at, certainly at current prices, 90% of the U.S. goes away at spot. Now that's not going to happen. We're not going to have 30 for the next five years flat. But at the forward curve, re-rates even to 45, you're going to see 50% of the industry that needs a solution. Now not everybody's going to be in bankruptcy, but they're going to have to be restructurings. The reason that hasn't happened, I, I think directly to your question, Robert, is we entered 2015 with a robust amount of liquidity coming out of a very, very buoyant capital markets environment in 2014. People had turned out maturities, revolvers were undrawn, people had hedges. We are now in a very precarious situation here in the US. Something like the quarter of the industry's hedge versus 75% this time last year. The revolvers are, <laughs> the, for those of you who follow the industry, the revolvers are a big part, the RBLs, these reserve-based facilities, are a big part of the capital structure. But this is a classic mismatched funded structure where your assets are long term and your liabilities are short term. And on average, the average EMP has something like 50% of their debt in the form of RBL. And on top of that, and I don't want to digress too much, but the um, OCC, for, for those of you in, on, on uh, the regulatory, regulatory side have been following it, has made it very difficult for, for the banks to stay in this business. Long-winded way of saying that the key funding source, the cheapest funding source for the industry is being pulled away from underneath it. So with that kind of dynamic, with tw you know, 28 or $30 oil on the front end and increasing spot exposure, we think you're going to see a pretty substantial uplift in the number of restructurings. And of course, the first companies to go are the worst companies because they tend to have the highest cost structures. 
Over time, if this is sustained, you're going to start to see this go from the fat to the muscle to the bone. And so then it becomes a question of how long can we sustain um, oil prices at, at uh, levels commensurate with today. I, I meant to go this way, but it, it's getting a bit technical now, so I was wondering whether Steve, as, uh, as general counsel, um, as a lawyer by training and, and, and job description, can do us the favor and explain br briefly what the surf base landing is. <laughs> on how well, it I mean, there, there are probably better experts in the room. I can see some in the back of the room right now on this. But, but I mean, quite simply, reverse, reserve based lending is when your collateral is your reserves. And, and, the, and as, the, as the price of the commodity shifts, banks have an ability twice a year typically to do what's called a redetermination. Um, where they where, where they say you, you no longer borrow $100, you can borrow $50. That's fine if you borrowed $40, it's not great if you borrowed $80. Um, if you borrowed 80, you gotta find some cash. And, and as, as Shai said, nobody has that cash anymore. So I think at least in our experience, what happened is the first go round of this, which sort of happened you know earlier this year, banks were, maybe they were able to exert more pressure on the, maybe the Fed wasn't exerting the, the pressure they are now. Maybe they were just trying desperately to keep their clients and everybody thought this was a short term issue. There weren't a lot of heavy redeterminations, at least not in our experience. Um, that was, that, that the second time around, which happened in the fall, that, that changed. And the next one I think is, you know, if we look at like when capitulation is going to occur, my view is it's happening now. Um, you have too many people who were given a little bit too much string in the fall um, that it hurt them a little bit in the secondary determination the third time around, unless they have someone large behind them who can, who can um, either put cash in or, you know, oddly because a lot of this debt is trading at such uh, discounted levels, if they can fix their problem by buying their own debt, I think you're going to have a lot of bankruptcies. You're not, obviously, you're not going to have everybody going bankrupt, but people are going to be in desperate need of restructuring. Uh, Tom? Well, I, I half agree. Um, the... the the noose is clearly tightening, and uh, uh, my sort of simple description <coughs> is if you keep a price environment similar to today uh, through the remainder of this year, that 50 percent of the industry, and I mean by numbers of companies, not by dollars, because Exxon's just fine, um, and 50 percent of the oil service business will die. Now, they won't all die the same way. And I think in many cases, they are not going to die in bankruptcy because so many of these companies, for example, have been financed with the uh, subordinated or at least unsecured debt that's trading for 20 cents on the dollar. So they buy it. My friends at Riverstone, who have far too much money, uh, <laughs> will, will step in and buy bonds and will loan to own, as it's called. And that a lot of us, as well as uh, people who are oriented towards uh, distressed debt and used to spend their time in housing and other areas are going to turn to this industry. And there will be very, very significant numbers of out-of-court settlements where you will hand most of the ownership of the company to at least the junior debt. And the banks, at least so far, and I, I was with uh, J.P. Morgan uh, uh, earlier this week, a rather senior officer, and said, we intend to foreclose on no one. Well, I can assure you a good number of their loans are underwater. They are just choosing not to foreclose and let this try and resolve outside the bankruptcy court because they don't want to take ownership of the yeah, assets. Yeah, that's the last thing the banks want right now, and that's, that puts them in a, in a really tough spot. Yeah, I mean, put, put, yeah, putting aside the private equity uh, piece of it for a second, you know, if you, if you feel that one of the strategies behind what the Saudis did was to essentially destroy the North American uh, oil and gas business, you'd have to say in many ways they've been fairly effective. That uh, dr drilling rigs utilization in Canada are down 79 percent, and the United States are down 65 percent. And when you look at a drilling rig, what you need to appreciate is how many other companies, and every time a well is being drilled, how many other companies are somehow involved in that well being drilled ecosystem, whether it's seismic companies, fracking companies, logging companies, caterers, you know, guys who drive, you know, trucking companies, on and on and on. And I don't know if it's bankruptcy or they're just all out of business. There's, there's, there's no business to be done. And so it starts, the service companies are gonna, in, in many respects, a lot of them are just going to go away. Now they have the ability to come back quickly. Um, in terms of reserves, 
I mean, what you have, what, what you're seeing now, of course, I mean, the interesting thing about wells that get fracked, if you stay onshore, is 65 or 70 percent of what they're going to produce gets produced in the first couple of years. Does that sound about right to you, Tom? Yeah, different by basin, but it's yeah. a good approximation. Right. So we're not drilling that many new wells. It's, it, it's going to start declining very quickly. And so the reason why you didn't have a, a large number of defaults or bankruptcies in 15 was people drilled wells in 14, the first half of 15. They were still in a you know, pretty robust production. Um, even though the price was down, the, the price was still higher than the sort of marginal operating expense of the wells. So it was generating positive cash flow. A lot of the, this debt was on a very favorable terms, like interest only, and so they could meet their debt service. That's all gone away. I mean, we're going to look back on 2015 in terms of the ability to service debt as like the really great period. And these companies with a lot of debt, they're not drilling new wells. Their cash flows are going way down, both as a result of price and just much lower production. And I don't know if it's going to be bankruptcy or restructuring. There's a lot of rumors that the Dallas Fed you know, has done conference calls with J.P. Morgan and a lot of other banks and said, we don't want you foreclosing, we don't want you owning assets, we want you to create a soft landing. I don't know what that means. I mean, companies can't meet, you know, companies can't meet their debt service, whether the banks foreclose or just never loan them any money and those companies go to business. The, the net effect of it is we're gonna have a lot less production and you know, it's all gonna have to get worked out either in bankruptcy or just through a loan to own or sale of assets. I want to ask um, one more question related to this first part here, and then we're going to go into the, the you know, interim uh, Q&A. Um, so up to now, you know, when we talked about oil and gas, we were really talking about EMP, um, the upstream sector. But of course, you know, the transformation of the domestic industry in the last uh, decade or so wasn't confined to that enormous investments in midstream. And, um, and, and, and midstream, you know, is the one link in the supply chain that was always thought of as being immune to, to commodity volatility. And um, which wake up, you know, wake up call is occurring there as well. So what, what's your view and uh, whoever wants to take it, um, you know, what's your view on how all of this is impacting the domestic midstream industry? Um. Well, one of my claims to fame, although it may be uh, soon about to be claimed to shame, is that with Vincent Elkins, I did the second ever MLP in 1981. So uh, a lot has changed since then, and, and the structure and its uses have been, have been turned to, to very broad application. I think you have uh, uh, almost as dramatic a shift going on in the midstream business as you have in the, in the E&P business. And, the worst part about it is because of MLPs, uh, these instruments, along with REITs, were sold overwhelmingly to retail investors. And years and years ago, I had the misfortune uh, to walk through the trading floor of, of Lehman Brothers while it was still alive and overheard a high-end broker saying, Mrs. Jones, I assure you, these MLP units are just like T-bills, but the yield keeps going up. And I broke out into a cold sweat and immediately called Vincent Elkins uh, uh, that I, we ought to stop dealing with those brokers at Lehman. Um, a lot of people believe this, and they are just finding out now, and it's going to get much worse for the same reasons that Bob was mentioning. This noose is tightening. And uh, Rich Kinder and a number of others who were just considered unlimited geniuses, and, and he is and was, uh, created these gigantic structures, tens of billions of dollars, off the assumption that these distributions would always be safe. They are not, they will not be, and it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. I don't think MLPs will go away, but uh, at least oil and gas investors, most of them that I know, think they're gambling at least a little bit. MLP investors did not believe they were gambling, and they're finding out that they were. Yeah, I think, I think the investment in MLPs over the last 10 years started with this fallacy that, that somehow the midstream sector, first of all, that MLPs were the midstream sector, and, and that's, that became not true over time as you, had, as you had basically EMP MLPs. And secondly, that the midstream sector was not, was not driven by the same commodity cycles, which is also not true because a lot of the revenue from the, first of all, it's, it's true that they're tollways, but something has to go through them, number one. 
And number two, a lot of the revenues for these companies are actually drilling carries and things like that. So I think what is exposed for the MLP market is, is the MLP, which is built on growth, doesn't work well when you can't raise either equity or debt. Um, and, and so they're just they're all stuck in place. And investors, <coughs> because of the you know, brokers at Lehman and others, <coughs> got the idea that if the price goes down on MLP, you'd, just, you'd sell it. And, and so they just, they've been crushed across the board. I think you know, the other sectors, obviously, in the service sector, I think the industry is, is it's, it's probably going to be the worst hit industry. It's the one, the one that you, I mean, one of the reasons we, we, we had a, a little bit of a, 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 <coughs> a slow downturn in the companies despite the commodity price was that we were hedged out in the EMP companies. The service sector is, is notoriously hard to hedge. And as, you know, as, 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 as they stop drilling, you don't, they don't need porta potties and they don't need, you know, um, places for guys to sleep. And those companies just immediately have to now, shut mo down. Most of the service sector does not think of themselves as porta potty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, it turns out MLPs were not safer than a CD. Um, <laughs> and Tom's exactly right. They were sold wrong. Uh, they're down as a group, I don't know, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent. Uh, and just in case people don't know what midstream means, it took me a while to. to so now, you know, we're talking about pipeline, gathering systems, storage, and it, the, the primary source of revenue is like, as Steve just said, it, you know, you get paid for volume, you get paid through, for throughput. Sometimes it's a percentage of oil and gas revenue. And it's a lot of the midstreams took commodity price risk without, you know, tr you know real commodity price upside. And I think it's going to be the next big, you know, area of enforcement action, and just real problem for the industry because it was just vastly oversold to the wrong people, and it's difficult to see how it's going to come back, you know, in the near term anyway. Um, let's um, open it for a few questions. I just have um, one request. You know, please keep your questions to the topics discussed up to now. So if uh, one of the um, question <laughs> on your mind is um, how you're going to make money in the future, then we'll get to that. <laughs> Um, but you know, or, or if that, anyone has any suggestions, <laughs> <we're gonna make laughs> in the future. Uh, or, pre or let us know. And, yeah, and and, <laughs> and and as far as logistics for Q and A is concerned, there's a mic there. Um, and how do we do that? People step up, or if you can, or there's a there's a lady. <clears throat> uh, just yell, <laughs> just yell. I mean, yeah, we can hear you. Well, uh, th this morning, I think in the journal, but the, this morning I was just reading, and it's fairly staggering, that using import data, uh, demand for oil in China last year was estimated to have increased 1.6 percent. Uh, and at least based on my uh, long ago knowledge of economics and energy conversion into GNP, that can't be done. You can't grow 6.5 percent in any economy we have on Earth and have energy demand go up by 1.5. So one of those two statistics, in my view, is wrong. As I mentioned early on, I think this is 50-50, a supply and demand. Remember that Europe has been on its tail and remains on its tail since the world financial crisis. Japan hasn't grown in 20 years. Uh, China was the sole huge engine of commodity demand. And whether it's flat, whether it's growing slowly, it is certainly decelerating. And that production that was coming out of the US and some huge deep water developments in the Gulf of Mexico, West Africa, other places, that supply growth, that if the whole world had been growing 1%, 2 or 3% more rapidly in terms of GNP, would have been absorbed. But when the two curves crossed and supply is growing faster than expected and demand slower than expected, Unfortunately, the result is inevitable. 
Uh, Shai, you want to you know, like to answer as well? So the, the bad news is I'm probably not going to answer your question. The, the good news is I'll give you a framework to think about it. Um, about 70% or so of world demand for oil <clears throat> is driven by transportation. So regardless of what your view is about China, one of the, you have to differentiate between OPEX and CAPEX commodities, okay? China is transitioning from a, from a um, stimulus-driven economy to a consumption-driven economy, which is a natural part of its evolution. And that is going to weigh very heavily on what I'll call CapEx commodities. What's a CapEx commodity? When you build a building, when you build a bridge, you use steel, cement, you know, uh, a lot of different metals. And once you're done building it, you're done building it. You're not gonna continue to use those, but you're gonna heat that building for the next 100 years, and that's an OPEX commodity. So that's a really important distinction. I'm very concerned about the impact of China on iron ore on steel, and a number of these what I'll call CapEx commodities. I don't want to be benign about oil, but I think that the transition, the secular transition, from people riding bicycles to driving cars and flying, if you look at per capita air travel in China, it's off the charts. And I don't think um, you know it needs to remain off the charts to continue to support demand. So that, that would be one, one, one observ observation I'll make. The second observation I'll make is, Commodities, by definition, uh, are, are, are things that you consume because of their price, because there's a substitute effect. Now, that substitute effect tends to take time, and there's structural lags, because to build the substitution capacity takes time. But on a global basis, we have a lot of you know, idle substitution that, that can happen, or idle capacity that can substitute. So here in the OECD countries, we have seen a doubling in the growth rate of demand for oil. Again, I don't want to point you to be bullish, but I think it's important to recognize in the US, SUV sales are the highest they've been in five years. We, we, we actually happen to have a portfolio company that makes auto parts, so I can tell you it's a great time to, you know, to be selling SUVs. The final thing that I'll say, which is I think what the market least appreciates about oil prices, two things. One is that there is, you know, if you're a king, and uh, I don't think any of us on the panel are qualified to make this, but I'll, I'll make a conjecture. If you're a king, the first rule when you go to bed at night is you must wake up tomorrow and still be king. And the second rule is don't forget the first. And so, you know, there is a threshold price if China were to fall out of bed, where we're going to see contagion, Arab Spring type risk in the Middle East. We stress this, our portfolio companies, all the time for $30 oil. I can't even begin to imagine how you stress test the Middle East for $30 oil. A lot of these countries need 100 plus to balance their budgets, and these are the haves in OPEC that are 50% GCC countries. The other 50% don't have the reserves to stay alive for another three or four years. So there is a level at which OPEC will cut, and I don't think people are giving any value to that. And then the final point that I'll make, is in 1992, we had Iraq invade Kuwait. 7.2 million barrels a day of supply went offline. Okay, now that's a huge number, it's not gonna necessarily happen. <coughs> Libya, three million barrels a day went offline in the Arab Spring. Venezuela, in the early 2000s, 2.4 million barrels a day disappeared. Nigeria, close to two million barrels a day. I don't know where the next geopolitical event is gonna come from, but I think the compounded probability of no geopolitical event for the next three years, with everything that's going on in the world, seems quite quite low to me. So I would offer that as, as, as a way to think about that equilibrium. And, and, and none of that is priced into the price today. I mean, it's amazing that none of that, none of the Middle East risk that I think has always existed in these typically driven markets is, is, is factored to the price. I, I don't think that's right. Uh, because I think it's a fair fight. R remember that one week ago, the first tankers left Iran in a very long time. Uh, r remember that uh, uh, the production out of Iraq has been very limited. The production out of Libya has been close to zero. Uh, <laughs> Venezuela is on the verge of collapse. Uh, I can make an argument that you're absolutely right, geopolitical events will and have always play a major unpredictable role in the oil market. But I can make an argument 
putting aside the Saudi king, who I agree with you, don't forget the first rule, uh, with the exception of the Saudi king, I can make an argument that 50% of that could be incremental supply, just like the other 50% could be going away in the night. Well, we, we did a great job turning one question <laughs> into a... <laughs> Uh, into a 15 minute discussion. Maybe one more question at this stage and then, then we'll move on and we have more opportunity. Yes, please. You, it's fairly easy. When you come and listen to a panel like this, and we assure you that the price of oil has risen and is stable, short the market, because we'll be wrong. <laughs> yeah. it, it's, been, it's been a cyclical business for 125 years so far. There's nothing that I can imagine that is likely to change that going forward, unless Elon Musk invents something that puts us all out of business. Um, it's just cyclical, and by definition, it's like a financial panic. If people saw it coming, you wouldn't go to a cliff and then go over. It's unanticipated confluence of events, and of course the market will recover, and of course the market will again collapse. Unfortunately, we can't tell you when on either one. Yeah, you're, you're asking the right question, though, which is if there is a rebound, what does it look like? And none of us can give you an answer because we don't know any better than you do. I, I think what has me concerned is you know, oil got as high as 140 um, right before the global financial crisis. It came down to mid-30s and then fairly quickly came back to 100. And, and now, of course, is, is back into the low 30s or the high 20s. And is it reasonable to assume that when it rebounds, which it will, that it rebounds back to 100? For the reasons you're asking, which we're all alluding to, has something fundamentally changed in, the, in America's and the world's ability to deliver oil at a much lower cost that when it gets to a certain price, whether it's 50, 60, 70, 80, a massive amount of new supply comes on the market and there's a new ceiling to it. And that's the big question, and I don't know the answer, but that's the one that will you know, determine how our returns are. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll weigh in as well. Uh, you asked about private equity and the impact on the market. Uh, usually the answer depends on whether the person's fundraising or not, so you, you'll probably figure out where we are based on my answer. Uh, 4.3 trillion, that's the cumulative CapEx needs through 2018 on a global basis. Two trillion is what you need just here in the US. Um, 100 billion is the face value of debt that trades at distressed levels. 60 billion, according to Robert, is the money that's been raised by private equity. And I would submit to you that the, the money that's been raised by private equity that's actually capable and qualified to do some of the things we just talked about with balance sheet destructions is a fraction. There's a lot of great distressed managers that don't understand energy. There are a lot of great man energy managers that don't understand distress. And I'll make one, one, last, one last point on that. The one, the one thing about the oil supply that I think has changed, there's a mega trend and there's a bunch of cyclical trends here. The mega trend is that shale costs are not homogenous. It's very heterogeneous. And the elasticity of supply, you know, in the 1980s, it took about three or four years to drop CapEx 50 or so percent. It happened in six months. That is changing the way that supply responds to demand and to price. And I think that's, that's a secular trend. That's just not a cyclical trend. So what you're going to see with OPEC out of the market, because OPEC has been a shock absorber for volatility. With OPEC out of the market, you're going to see continued volatility, and you'll see ceilings, and you'll see floors on oil prices over five-year periods. I think it's a question of being able to be nimble. 
uh, as, as an investor? I, I don't think it's a necessarily a, a straightforward answer, but I think that's, that's maybe one way to think about it. I couldn't tell. Are you fundraising or not fundraising? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Robert would let him on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, We're I, all, I, th I think, I think this was also, you know, without design, a, a perfect question to get us into that second part. You know, what's going to happen, and particularly, what are you, what are you guys going to do? So very simple. What are you looking at these days? What what for your fund? What do you see as the opportunities? Maybe we, um, uh, we go well, this way. Well, we've, we've talked a little bit about, about what we're looking at now. Um, we're not looking at what we were two years ago. Um, we're looking at restructuring opportunities. We're looking at buying debt, which we haven't historically done. We've always had these carve-outs in our fund and just never did it. Um, we're doing a lot of just trying to figure out how to um, maintain the companies we currently have in our portfolio. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the difficulties in private equity is all your investors that you're trying to raise your next fund for are also investors in your prior fund, and it's all the same pool of capital. So um, you're, 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 you're sort of talking out of both sides of your mouth sometimes. Um, but I think, there's, I think right now it's not going to be doing the same types of investments because n none of these, none of the sort of management back deals um, make a lot of sense today. It'll be, it'll be w certain, certain basins where people who are smarter than I am with an organization who feel confident are going to be the ones that come back first um, and, and distress opportunities. Tom? Uh, I, I think it's going to be uh, very uh, diverse. Um, I think you're going to see private equity provide drill codes, the, the money to drill and complete wills that the companies can't afford within their cash flow and get constraints uh, to do. You're only going to be able to do it where you and they agree that that rock will yield at the current or close to the current strip a return so that your seniority on that money works. It doesn't do you any good to, to be senior if it's going to be a losing proposition. I think there's going to be a lot of money priming uh, more junior debt. Uh, there'll be people buying up debt that's trading for 20 cents on the dollar. If you have a covenant light deal, you're going to get a phone call that someone has a second secured position ahead of you that has completely taken out all your uh, uh, financial uh, uh, correction here. And then there'll be classic workouts where you'll provide the dip financing and, and bankruptcy or, or, or similar things. But I think it's going to be much more diverse. The pattern five years ago was, give me some smart guys, some acreage, let's bang a few wells, and we'll either flip it to another private equity firm who's bigger than us, or we'll, we'll go public and, and, uh, and, and do high fives. Uh, that's still going to exist, interestingly. I was with a group last week who were very smart, tough, old-style, pre-shale boom guys who are very hands-on, run-a-field guys. They, from some of these companies that are dying, as opposed to going out and accumulating acreage and drilling wells, some of these guys with much lower overhead than the public independents with airplanes and boards of directors and audit committees, some of those teams with private equity banking backing are going to go in and take over for the banks or even perhaps for the wounded companies the operation of those fields with a much lower overhead and figure out how to eke out even in this price environment a few dollars in the situation. So I think it'll be very diverse. Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, guys who went to law as well as business school uh, working in our business, and they're all going to a lot of meetings considering a lot of things as we speak. Yeah, so my, my company, uh, Ridgeway Energy, is, has a very narrow focus. So all we do is we drill and develop oil fields in the deep waters of the Gulf of Mexico. and um, it's interesting, it's slowed down, but it's also created a lot of you know, fascinating opportunities for us. One of the interesting things about the Gulf is if you drill a well today, you probably won't bring it on production until 2019 or 2020. So if you believe in the cycle, right now what we think we're doing and we believe we're doing is uh, taking advantage of a much lower cost regime. Um, a drilling rig that a year and change ago was four or $500,000 a day to rent it might be $150,000 a day. And as Tom pointed out, all the suppliers, the steel guys, the on and on, you know, they're taking much lower margins. 
So our costs have come down a lot. We believe that there's also a tremendous opportunity to buy uh, reserves, uh, to get involved in distressed sales, uh, to take over other companies' positions and projects, and to take less risk. So on balance, and you know, private equity people tend to say this when, when prices are down, it really ought to be you know, a period of great opportunity. And you know, whereas our pacing and capital is a little bit slower, there's less activity, we do think there's an opportunity to make significantly better returns over the long term uh, now. Now, I also should say we're producing a lot of reserves as I'm sitting here. To, you know, we produce, let's say, 25,000 barrels of oil today. And when you thought you were going to get 80 and you're getting 30, you know, that's a million dollars less a day of revenue, which hurts. But, uh, you know, you got to take the long view. These are long life fields. So I, I said earlier that uh, the private equity business is a terrible track record with short-term commodity prices. So st staying true to that, I think the only insurance policy you have against that is to buy top decile and top quartile assets on the cost growth. Unfortunately, uh, there are a lot of people who want to do that, uh, and there are a lot of people who uh, have, have been trying to do that with limited success in the last year. So how do you set yourself up to be successful? Um, you know, I think there's a lot of different channels that uh, a private equity firm can originate a deal. You've heard about one, which is management teams, backing teams to find where the puck is going to be. That, that's certainly a great channel uh, if, if, done, if done well. Another channel is to say, look, we, we, want to, we want to identify the rocks. We want to start with where the best rocks are. And we want to put together an interdisciplinary approach. And we're agnostic. We'll buy debt. We'll buy equity. We'll back a management team, and we'll do everything in between, the holy grail being the rocks. And, and the reason I, I say that is most of you probably no longer carry Nokia phones here in this audience. My guess is most of you are, are using Samsung or, or iPhones. And it's really the effect of the technology. And in, in the shale uh, analogy, there are going to be a good number of plays in the lower 48 that will have no bid. There will be no buyers for those plays. Those are plays that are on the wrong side of the cost curve. They may produce too much water. They may not have access to infrastructure. There's a whole host of reasons why they won't be attractive. And unfortunately, those are the ones that are on sale today. So the best that you can do, uh, whether you're private equity or, or you know, any kind of investor, is to allow yourself the flexibility to be able to be competitive when going out for those high quality assets. Hey. A common theme, and it wasn't mentioned here, but a, a common theme that, that you hear from guys like you these days is optionality. You know, look at structures that, that create option value or that create optionality. Um, can you, maybe with some examples, like explain what that is uh, or what would be structures um, what's the new paradigm that that um, that reflects that as compared to the way use, deals used to be done? If it's okay, Steve, with you well, again. Well, I mean, I think we've already mentioned two of them. The, the, I mean, the flavor of the sort of last or last year was the drill co. Um, people starting to play in the debt. Those are both things people are starting to do. The, the problem with all maybe, of these. Maybe you want to explain what Sorry. a drill co is because. Well, no, as Tom's <laughs> explaining, this is this is basically working. At, rather than backing a management team, this is going to companies. You're getting much, instead of sort of backing a company with two or $300 million and saying, go find the rock, they're bringing the rock to you and saying, this, we want to, we're actually going to drill these wells. And you're gonna, you may have a preferred position, maybe it's a preferred pursuit position, but you're, you're just, you're investing in certain wells that a company has. Um, the problem I think with all these structures is that, is that the in the oil industry historically, a lot of really smart people, but um, people don't all have the skill set to invest in in debt and equity. They just don't, and they don't know how to do it. There are certain people out there that I think can, but you know what you saw last year at the, I guess the beginning of last year, you had. A lot of drill codes done, and then you had a lot. Of, you had an enormous amount of, of energy credit raised, including us. And thank God we kind of got delayed because people who rushed in with energy credit at the beginning of last year lost a lot of money. And and so you had a lot of you actually, and I think other people have probably seen. You had a lot of non-energy fund investors go in who maybe had real skill and credit, not as much skill in understanding what the right rock was, and they lost some money. So it's great that there are lots of opportunities available, but it's 
the industry itself, I don't think, is equipped to do every deal that comes in the door uh, at most places. Can I just yeah, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to give. I don't know how many of you are oil and gas people. So uh, if, if you are, forgive me and indulge me. If you're not, you might find this interesting. Uh, West Texas, which you may have read about, the Permian Basin, is an area for the aerial footprint the size of Massachusetts. And it contains about 250,000 potential drilling locations, if you believe some of the geological studies that have been uh, published. That is roughly, to give you a ballpark, 170 billion barrels of total resource potential. That's Saudi Arabia's old crude reserves are 270 billion. So we're talking about an area the size of Massachusetts that 10 years ago was the largest, most uneconomical oil field. And you know, going from gel to, to slick water techniques and landing laterals in better zones, and a lot of technology that's subsurface has unlocked this monstrous potential. So you might ask, well, what's the upside from here? Good rocks always get better. The Permian, the reason people really like it, has 12 benches. That doesn't mean you're going to produce oil from 12 benches. You're looking at anywhere from two to four today. But we're only recovering 10% of that oil today with conventional techniques. That 10% becomes 11, 12, or 13. You're talking about a step change in the economics. So when you buy tier one acreage in the Permian, you're getting a call option on three things that you may not be paying for. Number one, you're getting a call option on technology, and that's a secular trend. So subsurface technology means that you're gonna get more with less every time you drill. Above, tech above surface technology gains means you're gonna get more with less cost. So that's one piece of it. Number two, inflation. <coughs> I don't think any of us here, again, are capable of predicting <coughs> inflation, but if you believe we're going into an inflationary environment and you play for oil at $35, $40, you are getting a call option on inflation over the life of your investment. And then finally, number three, and we've kind of talked about this a little bit, is while you're buying an asset in the U.S. and its rule of law and its you know, property rights are held by the individual and it's, you know the environment that you're in from a regulatory point of view, you're getting a call option on geopolitical events far beyond the borders of the U.S. That is a very attractive asset class institutionally. It's a very attractive asset class, I think, for a number of um, uh, folks who actually invest in private equity and other assets. I think th those are optionalities intrinsic, as you say, to good rocks of the industry. I think the structure of the deals are focusing more and more on optionality built into the deals themselves. Uh, Take uh, an example of a private company. He, uh, he is not necessarily in financial trouble, but he's under financial pressure, meaning he can't pursue any material capital program next year because his cash flow and his bank lines won't permit it. And you say, all right, look, uh, we can't in this climate agree on what your equity is worth because it's come down 80, 90 percent perhaps in the last 18 months. What we can do is we can put $100 million of preferred equity into your business, but we get first dollar back. We get a 15% return. After we get a 15% return, 50% ownership in that income stream reverts to you. After we get a 25% rate of return, 85 to 95 or even 100% of it reverts to you. So you're getting a preferred return in that you're leaving at least the first layer of risk with the guy who needs the money, and you're taking a preferred position. Similarly, you can structure uh, uh, deals where you have warrants. Uh, you have a base level of return, either in a debt or a preferred instrument. The guy and you hope that the industry, the rocks, et cetera, will be kind over the next five to seven years, and you structure a base return, eight, 10, 12, maybe even 15%, but in addition, you take $1 warrants on 25% of his or her equity in the company so that you can participate fully in addition on equity upside. So those are some of the simpler examples, but lots of the deals you're going to see because of how peculiar the climate are is are going to be very complex forms of options on the results in the companies. Well, um if we ever do this again, we're going to schedule it for four hours. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, now we, we need to complete uh, the, the discussion here and still leave room for one or two questions. We don't want to run over time. Uh, one or two questions from the audience. 
that is it. Yes, please. Uh, Steve, you are the most global uh, investor on this panel. Maybe you want to... I mean, not happily always, but um, <laughs> I, look, I think every country is different. I mean, I, I think what we've found, we we have a portfolio company with several other uh, large investors called Cobalt that was drilling offshore Angola. It's really difficult for private equity to operate in places like Angola. It's, it's uh, and, and really, there's lots of places in the world where it's, where it's difficult. Um, it's, it's really better suited for the majors um, who who have a price tag they're using of, I don't know, $15, $20, whatever they happen to be using, and they're taking a much longer view than you can in private equity. So I think you'll, you're, you'll if you look at something like Angola with the with the, the deep water Angola where you're, you know, take 10 shots on Angola and maybe you hit one to, to use the analogy I used earlier, now, you know, you're much more likely to be successful. However, drilling those wells is incredibly, incredibly expensive. You may see some private equity there, but 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 it's just very difficult. You're still going to tend to see majors and some of the European um, oil companies, large state oil companies. Mexico, I view a little differently. Mexico is uh, it's it's closer. It's easier for uh, Americans to deal with. There's obviously a privatization going on. You've got pretty good expertise at, at a place like Pemex. Um, you've got great expertise, obviously, down in Brazil as well. But I think I think private equity play in those in those areas is. Is very limited for us. It's it's one investment in an entire fund. No, we're we're not even uh, permitted uh, under our fund documents outside the OECD countries. So we wouldn't be permitted. But I think the more important thing is we we wouldn't request it. Meaning it's so much easier given our business structure, model, and expertise, given the richness of what has and I think will continue to go on in the United States and perhaps in Canada and Mexico as well, to go further afield, to take on political risk, to take on the concentration of the massive offshore projects, it's just, it's more than we need. Yeah, I mean, I think the question you want to ask uh, is why is it $98 a barrel? In a, no, I mean, I don't know. I'm not saying that people, and when I look at you know certain countries where you know, it's 90, you know, 100, 105. I mean, as you can imagine, it's a global commodity. It's not as if I can sell it in Angola for 120, because, um, you know, Angola can buy oil in the global market and get it for 30 plus transportation today. And as long as you're that above, uh, you know, essentially a market price in terms of cost, and there's a perception of political risk, it's a pretty dire outcome. Um, you know, we have a team that's worked all over the world. We, we, we recruit a lot of people who worked at major oil and gas companies. And when we set out on what we're now doing, every one of them agreed to a, to a person. Um, the only place we wanted to be was in the United States. And they've, as I mentioned, they've worked all over the world. And part of it is, you know, America has a very uh, non-confiscatory um, regime in terms of royalties, and a lot of countries the oil companies essentially function as contract operators, meaning after they get their money back, the host country keeps 90% of the profit. And again, I don't, I don't know what the situation is. So the extent that it's a country that you're returning to, maybe someday you know, will be involved in the government of, 
I think there's just tremendous ability to improve things um, and get that cost down because it shouldn't be that high. Well, I, th I think the thing that's going to be very interesting in, in Africa, although we're not directly involved at all, is the reason that the United States is the dominant player and overwhelming leader in the shale revolution is not just that we were endowed with good geology or good rock, as it was called earlier. It's that private owners own the land. So <coughs> hundreds, thousands of different companies or individuals can go and lease your parents' land on your farm to try something. Someone else can go lease someone else's land and try a second thing. 50, 60, 80, sometimes in the old days, 90% of those people fail, but 10% of them succeed, and then other people imitate their success and, and develop the oil industry. One of the big problems when you have sovereign control of oil, you have a very small number of companies doing a very small number of projects, and like any science project, the fewer of them you try, the fewer succeed. So one of the huge things and it's really everywhere in the rest of the world other than the United States, is governmental ownership of the minerals enormously impedes the rate at which oil and gas is developed. Yeah, and I, and I don't think that's, that's not just an African problem. That's sort of no, everybody true. ex America, really, to be honest. And, and, um, and it's, it, I agree with you. It's the number of, of shots on goal, but it's, it's also simply you know, the people who benefit most from oil and gas um, are not the ones who have to bear the brunt of it in places like that. So the, the people who have to have the trucks driving down their roads and you know, potential spills and everything else are, are really not getting much out of it. And, that's, and that just makes it incredibly difficult to operate. You know, we've got a company in the UK and it's difficult to operate there because there's no direct ownership by the other people. They're get, you do things like try to build a community center to make people happy because they're not getting a royalty. They're not getting that mailbox money. Well, um I don't know about you, but I'm ready for a glass of wine out there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, thank you, um, thank you for your attention. Pleasure. And, and, and most of all, thank you, thanks to the panelists. I thanks.